What's up everyone, Steven here from techmaker.tv. In this episode, I wanna take a quick look at Ruby blocks. And I wanna let you know now that I'm gonna be putting out a few kind of fundamentals of Ruby type videos. Um, they're they're gonna be a little bit, uh, we'll probably explore and do a little bit of in-depth kind of stuff like we always do. Um, but I have some other content that I want to get to that is going to involve a little bit more advanced Ruby. And I just wanted to make sure that I went ahead and covered some of the fundamentals so I have that resource available on my channel. So if you're interested in that, be sure to subscribe. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. But all of that said, let's go ahead and get started with a quick walkthrough of blocks. So as usual, I'm going to start by just opening up an IRB session. And actually, this is pretty much going to be all in IRB. And I also want to give a quick shout out to a subscriber. I think your name is Carolos. I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation. Um, but I didn't know this, but you can hit uh, Control L and it will clear the terminal. So I'm always... Uh, getting really far down in here and then quit and clear but apparently whether you're in IRB or anywhere else you can come all the way down here and hit control L and just go back up to the top so that's awesome and thanks for the tip if you ever have any kind of tips you want to give me feel free and I'll uh, try to give you a shout out all right well anyway let's get going so what is a block so everybody if you've done any Ruby whatsoever has seen something like this um, where you're iterating through something and then you do dot each do and then you give it like a variable name between pipes and then you like do puts in something like this. So this section here, this do pipes in puts in end, that's a lot of very similar sounding stuff. This section here is what's called a block. So without a doubt, when you're iterating is the most common use of blocks that I have personally seen in Ruby. So if you're using something that's enumerable, um, where you're like looping through, so if you're calling dot map or dot find all or whatever, any sort of the stuff that you might do on arrays or some sort of collection, that's where you're typically going to see blocks. Um, and that's actually a little bit more complicated of an explanation, so we'll save that for later. In this episode, I want to look at what is a block fundamentally. And even though this is the most common use case, it's definitely not the easiest to explain because it involves enumerators and so on. So I want to look at a more basic situation. So any method can take a block. And one thing I want to point out here is that blocks live in this sort of funny intersection between uh, we're in a very object-oriented language but blocks kind of have a history of they're being like from functional languages so it's kind of a weird thing when you uh, start using it for the first time but let's look at something so if we just make a method and we call it demo um, and then we write yield and then end so what happens if we write if we just try to call demo now so demo is going to throw an error and say there's no block given. So what this yield keyword does is it basically says call the block. So whatever block is given to us, run it. So let's have a look at that. So we can say demo, and I forgot to say earlier, you can use this do uh, pipes format, or you can also use curly braces. So let's just uh, return a string here. Um, so it's going to just return that back to us. We can also puts, and it's going to run puts. So basically, we can put any sort of arbitrary code in here, and running demo is just going to run that code because all it's doing is saying, call this call this code. Whatever is passed in, just run it. Um, I mean, we could do anything. We could actually you know, declare a class um, and so on. And so now, uh, if I say dog equals dog dot new, that's actually declared a class. So you can pass in any code into the block. Okay, so I just uh, kind of messed up on my shortcut there. Okay, anyway, so let's set up a new function or a new method rather. So we'll write a method called I don't know, like do. Um, let's call it add. I was going to call it do some math, but let's just call this one add a, b, and then let's yield a and b and end. Okay, so now if I call add 1 and 2, 
it's going to give me the same error and then I can give it a block and what happens now is because I'm providing variables back to the block um, those variables or those arguments rather uh, the arguments I'm providing uh, I can declare them like this so between the pipes so that's how arguments actually end up in the pipes is being yielded as arguments like this so now I can say a plus B and we'll get three back so let's do that again but let's actually uh, write this method out and say what we can actually do is capture the result of the block being called in a variable and then use that variable so what we can do is something along the lines of result equals yield a and b and then we can say puts uh, the answer is and then uh, result something like that and now if I add uh, 3 and 4 and then I give it a block and I say a b and then a plus b so you know basically you're you're kind of mixing together um, the answer from the block and the actual code inside this method okay so let's look a little bit at something well I want to go over one more kind of uh, simple example and then I want to talk about scope gates so a simple example is basically that right now what we're doing I think is called an implicit block so when you call yield um, you're not specifically saying to the method hey you're going to have a block if you want to do that what you can do is something like um, let's do add again a b and then and block and then we'll say uh, block dot call a and b so this is now explicit so um, now if I call add one and two and then I give it a and a b and then a plus b it's gonna be the same thing the nice thing about that is I can actually call this uh, something more relevant like math and then we'll say uh, math dot call and then let's uh, a b so you can actually basically name it so when you call yield or when you just have yield and you don't specify the name of the block um, it's just it's just running it um, but it's sort of invisible this way you're you're a little more declarative about what your intention is so what blocks basically allow us to do um, and I'm going to clear this again um, so let's have a look at something so if I say like um, local variables let's see what I've got in my local variables here basically underscore um, and that's a special thing in IRB that just returns whatever the last thing you did is and I was playing with this earlier and this is a really good way to confuse the heck out of yourself because I typed local variables and then I was like oh I have a, a variable called underscore what is that and you hit underscore and you get that and you're you're in uh, you're now in inception um, but then I remembered because I do this all the time and I just wasn't thinking underscore just returns whatever the last thing was so you could do inception underscore forever with the local variables thing um, so anyway um, inception aside um, I'm really gonna use the heck out of this control L thing now so just get ready um, anyway so we have this local variables thing so if I say a equals one and then I do local variables I'm gonna get a and then my underscore now if I do def test and then I say B equals 2 and I do local variables um, and I run test you can see that I'm getting a local variable of B so the variables are completely cut off from one another so I can't reference or talk to a when I'm inside of this test method and I can't talk to B from outside now obviously you probably wouldn't expect if you've done much development to be able to talk to B from outside test that really wouldn't make any sense but I think in some languages you could potentially talk to a from inside the function definition or method definition so what blocks do is actually give us a way to sort of uh, talk to or allow our variables to cross these uh, boundaries basically 
uh, these scope gates. So normally we wouldn't be able to talk to A from inside of test, but let's write test in such a way where we say um, def test and then we'll say B equals to and I want to do B times yield and that's it. And now I've got A which is 1 Let's actually make it uh, a equals five, and um, let's say test, and then a. And so basically, what we're doing here is we're passing a into test um, in a way. So this has to do with something called closures, and um, I'm probably going to do a full episode on closures soon. Um, so we won't really get into it here, um, but this is basically blocks. This method here where we're basically using blocks to pass stuff into a different scope is a method called flattening the scope. This turns up in a number of strange ways. So for example, like let's say we have a variable called, um, well it doesn't even matter, ASDF equals one, two, three, four. So if I write a method normally and I write like def uh, test and then I say puts ASDF. Well, that's going to blow up anyway because I did it wrong. Let's do that again. Def test puts ASDF. And, and then I run test. It's going to tell me there's an undefined local variable or method ASDF. On the other hand, if I do this with a block, I can say define method test do. And then I can say puts ASDF end. And now if I run test, it's going to put out uh, one, two, three, four. And again, this is basically happening uh, because uh, the block will take the um, variable scope that it exists in and bring it into whatever uh, it's being called in. Um, so basically what's happening here is we have an ASDF variable in our top level scope but this block carries that scope down into this method definition. So um, it's pretty it's pretty funky and it takes a little bit uh, to get your head around it. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna do an episode pretty much dedicated to closures pretty soon. So um, if you're interested in this, look for that. But I think that's it for this episode. I just kind of wanted to do a little teardown because I'm definitely going to be doing more uh, metaprogramming stuff and um, some more advanced Ruby stuff soon. So I wanted to make sure I had something covering this. So all of that said, if you like this video, uh, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I don't want you to miss out on anything. Um, and I will talk to you in the next episode.